Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are navigating the journey. And today, we are journey, our journey is right here in Honolulu. And we are going to visit with Della Albalades. She's a dear friend. And all of you that have been watching, you know, you know I only talk to dear friends. <laughs> and she is the majority leader in the House of Representatives. And this time, the time is right now, we are in what we're calling election season. Since we, the state voted a couple of years ago, they were ahead of the curve that we would do all mail-in voting, balloting. And it, we did it for the primary and it worked wonderful. It's the largest turnout we've had since statehood. So, so we're going to meet with Della today, Representative Della Albalades, and we'll talk about the legislature and this voting season and what the legislature does and how it does it. So welcome, welcome, Della. Thank, Thank you for taking the time to be with us. Thank you for having me, Marsha. I always enjoy speaking with you. Oh, you're so sweet. Didn't I tell you people that I only talk to dear friends? <laughs> but so talk, tell us about Della. So I was elected in 2006. Mm -hmm. uh, I am also a practicing civil rights attorney. So I, I'm a legislator and an attorney. Uh, I have two beautiful daughters and a wonderful partner in life who makes sure that I stay on track. Um, I just, uh, I feel very privileged to have served in the state house for uh, close to 14 years. And mm -hmm. I have the very um, special privilege of serving as the House Majority Leader now. So you've had other positions within the hierarchy. So what, what do these different positions, other than the speaker, I know what the speaker of the house does, but what are these other positions? What do so you do? As, sure, as house majority leader, I get to represent the caucus. I help to shape uh, the agenda. It's a lot of um, working with other chairs and advancing priorities of the caucus. And it's really just um, helping to advance all of the legislation on behalf of the state of, the, uh, of, of Hawaii. Um, in addition to that, I mean, I am just a simple, I just have one vote as well. I am a state representative. I represent urban Honolulu, Makiki, Tantlis, Papukalea areas. Uh, and so I, I'm just one more voice amongst the 51 representatives in the state house of representatives. So you mentioned caucus, the different caucus. What, what is a caucus? So a caucus is a collection of members uh, for, you know, gathering because they have certain interests in common. The biggest caucus is the majority caucus, and it's all the elected Democrats in the House. We have a minority caucus, that's the Republicans. We also have subject matter caucuses. So for example, you've heard a lot about the Kapuna caucus, the Hawaii Women's Legislative Caucus, the Keiki caucus. And so those tend to be bipartisan groups and we focus around certain issues. So for example, for the Hawaii Women's Legislative Caucus, we've been leaders on advancing legislation um, to stop domestic violence, Title IX legislation in the vein of supporting and making sure women have equal opportunities in uh, educational settings. So th there are those types of caucuses. So there's lots of ways that we kind of cut and, and parse ourselves out. But at the end of the day in the state house, it comes down to the 51 representatives on the state floor and we each get a single vote. Now, 51, um, that is one from each district in the state, the whole state. Yes. And, yeah. you know, Speaker Psyche has been very uh, eloquent in saying this. You know, he really believes that the state house is the um, house of the people. Because right. we, as the elected officials, really represent almost the smallest unit of government, the smallest district. Senators typically represent three times as many people. City councils uh, also represent larger groups. Oh. So really, the House members um, are very much connected to their communities, and they are probably the closest representative uh, in this elected democracy that we have. Yeah, I know my the person that represents my district, he answers his own phone in the office. You call Absolutely. and he answers the phone, you know. <laughs> my favorite part of being representative is when I can go to the food land 
and I see my neighbors and they recognize me and we have yes. a conversation. So it's really quite wonderful. It is, it is. And with, because it's a smaller group, like you said, the city council is huge. Mm -hmm. And one day I'm gonna get up enough energy to I'll come back to you and sue the city. And, and no, in 1908, when it became a city, when they incorporated the city and county of Honolulu, there were eight in the council, whatever they called it, eight members. Here we are, 2020, and there's nine. Don't you think we ought to have more, more representatives? Probably so. Yeah, to, to increase by one since 1908, just something's wrong but that's a different story we'll come back to them some other time <laughs> okay now so back to the representatives it is you are created just like the feds right there's the uh, executive legislative and the court council or whatever the judicial judiciary, judiciary yeah yes yeah, so in the in our legislative branch we have two houses the mm -hmm. House of Representatives, which, which has 51 members, like I said, and then the Senate, which has 25 members. So it's a, a larger body, or it's a smaller body that represents larger districts. Um, we are bicameral. So when legislation moves through the House and the Senate during the legislative process, it has to pass both houses. And it has to get agreement from both houses. And then once a bill is agreed upon if there are any differences, then there has to be a conference committee. So that's how we work. And then the Senate in particular has different jobs. They also confirm judges and confirm appointments uh, in the executive branch. We don't have that task as the, as the House. Well, you've got enough to do. <laughs> okay, let's, let's go back a bill. How does, how does it become law? Where does it begin? Middle end. Sure. I know. I know, and everybody hears about days to cross over, and like nobody ever knows what it is, except that everybody knows. Oh, this is a crossover. So, so tell us if I had an idea, and I come to Della and I say I think this should be a law. How do we make it a bill, and how does it move? Da -da -da -da. So you actually hit it right on the head, Marsha. Um, a bill starts with an idea and really it can start anywhere in the community. And I think I'm gonna actually go one step back. What's really important is that right now, right now before session starts, so in October, November, December, is the time when community groups and stakeholders are really thinking about what do I wanna introduce? What is the idea I have that I want to introduce? So you can be talking to legislators like me now, sharing your ideas. And then what happens is in January, um, in our system of government, the only way an idea becomes a bill that can become a law is that it has to be introduced by a state senator or a state representative. We do not have um, initiative uh, in our in our state, and and I think um, that has certain implications. I, I don't support initiative um, typically because it can create some large problems at times. So really in our state, we have chosen to make sure that it's through your state representatives and state senators that you can introduce a bill. Now that's where after the introduction, that's the easy part. It gets a little bit more complicated because bills ideas have to be heard in both houses. So they go through a process where they're, they get, they're introduced in, in both houses and they may be the same content. They go through the committees, typically three readings on each side and they might get changed and then they cross over. So like how you said, they cross over from house to Senate and Senate to house. And then what happens is it goes through another process. And so we start off uh, typically with 3000 bills by the end of this process, after crossover and the final readings in both houses, we will whittle it down to about maybe 300 bills by the end of the session. Now that it doesn't just end there. So after both houses hear it, if there are still differences, then we go into a process called conference committee. And in conference committee, um, we have smaller groups of Senate senators and representatives who negotiate over the final language of the bill. And then it still doesn't end there because there has to be a final reading of the exact same bill by both House and Senate. 
So once that happens, we have a bill that's been passed, it goes to the governor, and it still doesn't end there. Once it goes to the governor, he can have an opportunity to vet it, to see, did we make any mistakes? Does he have any grave reservations? And then he can veto it. And the final check and balance is that if the governor vetoes it, and if enough members of the House and Senate say, no, governor, we don't agree with you, we can override the veto. So it's quite a long process, typically from January through maybe July. We end in May, and then the governor can review the bill until about July. Now, that's in a typical year. But this past year was a little bit different. We had a session that extended into June. So the governor actually didn't finish reviewing our bills until um, uh, early, late August, early September. And so those finally got got, um, they went through the process of veto and there were no vetoes or there were some vetoes, but there were no veto overrides this year. So we still follow that same process. It just got a little bit extended because of the pandemic this year. Now you mentioned, we talked about it, 3000 bills. Obviously, oh, your session though is broken into two, right? You yep. have yep. beginning in January, until May, then you have a recess and then you come back in January and complete this session. Is that correct? So we have what's called a biennium. Yeah. So every, every two years is sort of like a, a block, mm -hmm. right? And for the state representatives, representatives get uh, up for election every two years. So we deal, so for representatives, we deal in like two year blocks. And what happens is the budget is also a biennium budget. So typically in the first year of the biennium, we pass the executive budget. And then in the second year of the biennium, that's when we do the supplemental budget. And so that's a, that's a different kind of bill that uh, actually goes through all of the same processes, but it's the larger um, basic, you know, op operating budget of the state. So that, that, that is a very important bill yeah. to lots of people. Okay. So if you have 2,500 bills, the first coming this January, and everybody shows up, everybody's caucus has a bill, everybody's got something. Okay, so you put that in the hopper. Then some of those die, and some of those are carried over to the next session. Now, so yes. in between, do we get to come in with new bills? Yes. Oh, my God. So that's how you get, I know last year it was 3,000, but it's 51 people reading 3,000 bills, just it boggles the mind. So the way we do it, and this is what's great I think about our system of government is we have a system of committees, right? Mm -hmm. So it's close to impossible for anyone to read every single bill, but through the committee system, what happens is depending upon the subject matter, a, a bill is assigned different committees and different committees review it for different reasons. So for example, a bill, let's say about minimum wage, first goes through the labor committee because that's the most relevant subject matter, but then right. it eventually may go to the finance committee because it has fiscal implications. And so th that's how we deal with it. We take little bite-sized chunks of it and we look at them. And then some bills never ever get past the first committee. So that's one way which we kind of whittle it down to the very, very, very most important bills. I also think that this speaks to the fact that, you know, bills sometimes get introduced and reintroduced over a number of years. And honestly, sometimes it's, it's, it's very rare for a bill to get passed in the very first year that it's introduced. It can happen, um, but typically larger bills that have really huge implications. I mean, you and I have seen this, right? It happened with um, the aid in dying bill. It happened with the uh, cannabis. The cannabis, industry, right? cannabis yeah. so, there are bills that don't uh, get passed for decades. Mm -hmm. Now, we shouldn't leave it for that long, but at times, you know, it's a reflection that our communities are changing and the values are changing and people's ideas are changing. So I think that's one of the beauties of democracy. You can keep coming back and we can keep working on these ideas until we gain greater acceptance of it. And then we can pass really good policies. 
Okay, let's go back to the beginning. So I show up in your office with my typed, this is my idea. And I say here, this is what I want. Do you send that off to somebody to refine it, to make sure the language is correct and all of those kinds of things? Yes. So and then who decides where it goes, what committees? Sure. So we have drafting agencies that help us draft bills. And that's, it, it's, it's more arcane. It's more technical. We have to write bills in certain ways. So that's, we gave it to the drafting agencies. When bills get reported out and they're given a number, then what happens is in each chamber, the leadership um, has a process where they decide who gets uh, or what bills get assigned to what committees. It's called the referral process. So mm -hmm. in the house, uh, the way that we've done it here in the house is that a smaller group of uh, more senior um, house leaders review each of those bills. So we quickly look at it, look at the description, and over a period of about probably a week, um, we get the referrals out. Um, we are actually trying to work faster than that because um, you know our legislative cycle is very fast. So we have only 60 legislative days. And if bills don't get the proper hearings, uh, depending upon their referrals, then they can die. So um, it's really important that the referral process, we try to be quick about it. Um, and so that's, and that's, and that's what, what happens. So, but you have the, is that the LLRB or whatever it's called? Those are our drafting agencies, our LRB, Legislative Reference Bureau, uh, the House um, Majority Staff Office, and the House Minority Staff Office. There is another way that bills cannot get introduced before we leave this, um, uh, Marsha. The governor is allowed to submit a package of bills, um, and typically he submits his budget. So those bills get introduced um, by the House Speaker and the Senate President. Oh. And then they go through the same process. So as a courtesy to the um, governor's office, the House Speaker and the Senate President introduce the governor's package of bills. Do they work together on that or is that separate? The House and the and No, the it, it's typically the, the governor's office does it. Their, their government agencies do it on their own. And it's just a courtesy. We just introduce those bills as written. Yeah, no, I'm saying this, what I meant to say is, do you as the House, present it and does the Senate pre present it or is it one? Do you come together to present the governor's package? Uh, it gets introduced both on the House and the Senate, and the side. Senate side. Yeah. Okay. And so now that we've got this bill, let's, okay, so we're Democrats. The Democratic Party says, I have, we have, this is what our uh, people think is important this year. And this is what we voted on. So here's the package. Then what happens? And I mean, not, I'm saying Democrats because that's what I know, but I'm sure the Republicans do the same thing. Uh, what happens then when you have this, this package, as it's called? Sure. So after the committee assignments are referred, then the committee chair people, the chairperson, gets to decide which bills will be heard. Um, now, Members can lobby the chair to hear certain bills. And then typically when it gets heard, that's when bills get changed, amended. Anybody can come in and provide testimony during the hearing of a bill. And that's when you'll see changes being made. Now, you know, um, you mentioned the Democratic Party. There's lots of groups out there, caucuses. The Hawaii well, that's what I'm, I'm saying that because that's what I know, but I'm certain yeah. there are other groups doing the same thing. Yeah, so everyone and anybody can come in and basically lobby the legislators for what bill they want. And then we go through the amending process and then, you know, bills get changed. Bills get changed. So it's really important for members of the public to keep engaged. And then as bills change to continue to um, provide testimony, because uh, as some people have said, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. You it have is. to go from January to May and lots of things, lots and lots of things can happen with a bill um, in just a few months. Now, um, we hear a lot about, especially in, in, in Washington, D.C., about lobbyists. What is a lobbyist? Now, I, I'm not, but you know that I will follow a bill to 
forever. But uh, what is a lobbyist? So a lobbyist is typically an advocate for an issue, a group, and they there's different types of lobbyists. There's the paid lobbyist, right? You know, mm-hmm. the person that's their job. So they're working to advocate, and they can be working for all kinds of groups. Um, you know, there's corporations that, that hire lobbyists, there's community citizen groups that hire lobbyists, there's nonprofit organizations that hire lobbyists. So you can, a- anybody can hire a lobbyist. I think there's also what you call a citizen lobbyist. You know, any member of the public, particularly in the state of Hawaii, can essentially write to their legislator, email their legislator, call their legislator's offices, and basically say, this is what I think about a bill. So you have, you know, regular citizen lobbyists. Marsha, I would consider you a professional <laughs> citizen lobbyist. Professional you know, citizen lobbyist. You can come in and that's how people affect um, legislation. And, you know, in this day and age where social media is allowing us to really connect with all kinds of people, I would say that there's lots of people who now can get engaged um, at different levels in the legislative process. So for me, the word lobbyist is not a dirty word. It's it's a word that's meant to be you're engaged in the process and how are you trying to change and influence it? Uh, I know some people have a problem with the word lobbyist, but you know what? Everyone has the opportunity to weigh in and that's what's great about our system. And can we talk about the budget? Sure. Okay. Now, you know, I'm, I'm the world's worst, but I do know that the state depends on the tax. And with all of the hotels closed, what are we doing about that hole in the income? So I will say that this is like no other time that I've experienced in state government. And it's not just the TAT, the transient accommodation tax, right? That's the tourist tax that you're talking about. Right. Our GET, our general excise revenues tax, which is the broadest tax that allows us to really have lots of funds to be able to pay for all of the important government services we need. You know, things like roads, um, public schools, uh, highways, hospitals, all of that is paid with taxes. We are in a very, very serious situation when we have an economy that is virtually three quarters shut down when we don't have tourism coming in. So next year, is going to be a very, very challenging year where we are going to be chasing down hundreds of millions of dollars um, to fill. And it's having huge implications on what we'll be able to do. So it's very, it's actually very scary. It is very scary. Um, People are concerned about critical essential services being cut. uh, And so that is, that is, it's a reality. Um, I think we are though in this opportunity you know, I really hope that the federal government can provide more guidance. We really need help uh, with making sure that vaccines, when they are available, are, you know, given to all states. Uh, we really need to have to figure out a way to reopen our economy, and that takes national leadership. At the state level, we're trying to do that as well. We are looking for, looking for ways in which to reopen our economy, but we know from the studies done by the University of Hawaii Economic Research Organization, UHERO, that our economy is taking a huge hit right now. Oh, and that goodness. is what's very concer- dis- concerning. Yes, <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, when we look at uh, the empty streets and when you listen to the morning uh, news, and it used to be, oh, 40 minutes from my house to town, which is only 17 miles. And now when they talk about the traffic, oh, it's 15, 20 minutes. You know, it's so different. Uh, and everything's different because we're not going to go back to yesterday. So now I've heard so many people say they, and I saw a survey said 80% did not want tourism to come back. What else can we do? How do we supplant? What what else? Is there so, anything else, any other industry? So I think first we have to recognize that some degree of tourism has to come back. And this is actually the opportunity and the time to talk about how do we manage tourism better? 
How do we create the tourism economy that we want? That isn't 7 million people every year, but that's more manageable. So on that issue, what I would encourage is the Hawaii Tourism Authority is circulating these regional management plans, asking the people of Hawaii, what do you want tourism to look like? What should it look like? And I think that's a really wonderful opportunity that this pandemic is presenting us. Now, with that said, we shouldn't just rely on tourism. I think this, you know, people have said, never waste a good crisis. This is clearly an opportunity once in a century for us to re-examine what we are doing and how we can do better. So I take heart in the fact that, you know, we have some manufacturing that is starting to gear up and the legislature, the state house in particular, you know, all the things that we need to manufacture now because we are in a pandemic. There are industries, small businesses that are doing amazing things right now and we need to see how we can help them. We are facing um, huge questions about our food supply system. And so we have amazing, amazing farmers who can innovate now and work towards making sure they grow the food that we need here in the state of Hawaii. We have chefs who are out of work. We have small businesses and small restaurants that are, are closed down. We need to figure out how that economy can get restarted around the local needs. So I take heart in that. Um, but I would also just keep going back to, you know, you talk to these small businesses that do rely on tourism. We need to figure out what kind of tourism it is that we want, because otherwise we will lose many, many, many of our small businesses and restaurants. Well, Finally, I think I would add just one more thing. I think ahead. there's a lot of creative industries that are now seeding themselves. You know, we hear people talk about the creative arts. We hear people talking more about teleworking telecommuting, you know, we are doing things now differently. And there is this opportunity to look at how we are restructuring ourselves so that can we shift people into better, higher paying jobs? Telehealth has gone, you know, has skyrocketed and we if need- you remember, Yeah, if you remember, it took us two years to get that bill passed. Yep. yep. So- yeah. So before the pandemic, we had demands for healthcare workers. We still have demands for healthcare workers. We still need to fill those um, workforce shortages. So now is a great time that if people are unemployed, if they can upskill, if they can, if you know, if you were a janitor at a hotel, if you wanted to now become a janitor at, at a hospital, is there other different things you need to learn? Or can you, can you, if you were a nurse's aide somewhere, maybe can you go back to nursing school and upskill yourself? Up this well, is the opportunity to do that. We are just about out of time. Oh no. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it does. It goes so fast. But uh, thank you for spending this time with us. And we will continue this discussion. Uh, and the Speaker of the House, Scott Psyche, says that we will have a legislator on the first Wednesday of each month so we can talk about what's going on with the legislature, especially as we get into the bill process. Absolutely. So, so thank you again, and we will talk to you soon. All right, thank you, Marsha. Thank you all, FinTech Hawaii. You guys are fantastic. Aloha.